Uh, by the way, did, did you take a look at the exercises for the previous chapter? I looked at one of them. <laughs> now I'm remembering, not remembering which one it was. I just did one of them. I didn't really uh, have time to do much more. So um, you're talking about the chapter before. I actually did some on this chapter too already, I think. Let me get our, let me, oh, I don't have it. I, I had to just updated my computer, so I don't have all the files on here. Oh, wait, I can check on GitHub, though. Did you do any of them? I guess I should ask. Yeah, uh, not really. OK, well, then I'm not missing They're <laughs> getting kind of. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like, I agree. Only numerically tedious uh, yes. instead of, like, I, I don't feel like I would learn something special by doing them. I did um, exercise one, I guess. Is that it? That seemed like that was a big lot of, I did a lot of work on exercise one. Yeah, I guess I just did exercise one for that, for chapter seven. No, chapter I, I think, I think, uh, I, I mean, if you remember, in the first session of the of the lectures uh, of the lecture videos on yeah. this book, yeah. I, I think you also mentioned that the author says that this is probably the hardest uh, course in 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 that university. Yeah, and, and in the beginning it didn't seem that way, at least based on the exercises. But from the type of uh, exercises that we have now in these chapters, I think that may be the case because the exercises are quite tedious, like. To numerically they very are yeah yeah so i've been kind of I, backing uh, off on them myself too yeah but the, I, at least the theory is really interesting yeah i think this chapter i found it very interesting I, this is actually the first time i've really been exposed to the formal notion of a biased estimator and a consistent estimate i've heard those words before and i kind of just felt like i had a quasi intuitive sense of oh bias means good <laughs> but now I have a much better understanding. Now I don't think bias necessarily means, not unbiased necessarily means bad anymore. So that was a big help for me. Um, yeah. Yeah, also I, I only got now a uh, why for the sample variance, we don't divide by the number of samples. Sorry, by, by the number of observations, but we have to like, I think shift it by one in order right. to make it unbiased. Right. Uh, that was interesting to learn. Yeah, that was interesting. But what I thought was interesting is that even though it's a, even though if you don't shift it by one, it's, it's a biased estimator. It's still consistent. So for large numbers of observations, it's fine. Um, the fact that it's biased doesn't matter, which is which is reflected in the fact that n minus one is basically n for large n anyway, right? And then for me, I think for small n, the, there's a lot of uncertainty in what that um, random variable. Well, that's random variable has a lot of uncertainty anyway. So, is the mean necessarily the right measure for that random variable anyway? Is the fact that it's unbiased? Maybe the median is better anyway. I don't know. You see what I'm saying? So, that gave me a little more insight into whether or not bias was really that important. I don't know. Yeah, and he also discusses that point if we should really be optimizing the mean instead of something like the median. Uh, in that part about neural networks, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know. Um, I know probably close to zero about deep learning, but at least that, that analogy that he made about the, uh, how they are trying to find some minimizing function. Yeah. Uh, like in that aspect, it did make a little bit of sense to me. Uh, perhaps also, I, I hadn't really considered much if when the fitting error, sorry, the fitting norm is is precisely, sorry, when is the L2 norm, the, the basic Euclidean one, uh, a good fit for the errors. And right. the, the only one I knew that may, maybe using the L1 can be better is what, what you showed in your in the previous chapter for Outlier. better handling of suppliers. Yeah, robust, robust regression. Yeah. Although the other way to do that, I guess, and maybe it's related, but it's use the T distribution. Do you what? Use the, uh, no, I'm sorry. 
that's a, um, when you're doing Bayesian regression, you can do robust by using a T distribution for your um, probability distribution. That's what I'm thinking of. Never mind, irrelevant detail. I apologize. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I'll be in the presentation. Okay, cool. Yeah, you don't need to go into any of the, you know, super details on things that are, that are super detailed, so to speak. But, yeah. Okay, so for the video, uh, this is cohort one of probability for data science. We are in chapter eight. In this chapter, we'll be covering estimation. Uh, it has a little bit of relationship with the previous chapter that is with the concept of regression, but mainly the problem uh, is quite different. In this case for estimation, uh, it says it's an inverse problem. And now the goal is to recover parameters from a uh, distribution. And such, such recovering uh, will also depend on the observed samples. We, uh, know, so first let's define what do we mean by parameters? It uh, really is uh, the same, but the same thing that we have been working with uh, in the case of PMF or PM or PDF. For example, for for a Bernoulli distribution, uh, we have clear what the parameter is. In that case, it's simply such probability of success or well or of failure. And so via this notation uh, that we have introduced over over here. We, we basically can model this problem in, in this sense that we have some joint distribution f of x that depends on all the observed samples. Here, here are the, sorry, these little x are the, that, the data from the observed samples. And over here, this data, it really is a vector, not necessarily just a number. This data value is in the parameters that we want, well, the parameter or set of values that we want to, to find. So in this notation, uh, we have that uh, for any of these x sub m random variables, sorry, Bernoulli random variables, then we know uh, what is their p, what is their PMF. Really, is the same formula that we are accustomed to, but now the parameter that we usually label as p simply simply is the data now. And uh, well, similarly for the case of what is the parameter of a Gaussian. In this case, well, there are two values. Uh, I don't know why he chooses to label it via the usual syntax for, for an interval, but it's really like a vector of two values, uh, the mean and the variance. Those define the PDF for the Gaussian distribution. And so simply the Gaussian distribution, sorry, the PDF for this random variable that has a Gaussian distribution, it uh, would be this one. This is a parameter. We want to estimate uh, mu and the variance and simply the same formula for the PDF with respect, with respect to this specific observation of the random variable, x sub n. So uh, um, what do we mean by, I mean, we, we are going to be estimating parameters uh, of a joint distribution. So what is our fitting criteria? What do, what do we mean by a bad or a good estimation? And it's something like this, at least graphically. Uh, this is a, I think two dimensional Gaussian distribution. And the fit is represented via this, uh, well, ellipses or, well, right, ellipses, the circles are ellipses. So what they mean as a good or bad estimate is, for example, what we can see over here to the right, that this curve or region, or region in, in red does seem to fit quite well the, the observation, that the data that we have gathered. And these are the parameters being estimated, the mean and the covariance matrix. Okay, so in this chapter, uh, we cover three main topics. Uh, and they will be also differentiated by what kind of function are we uh, optimizing? So in this case, uh, we'll be working with, two, with these three different concepts. Uh, the first one is likelihood. Well, he uses notation, but 
In the first part, there is another definition for likelihood where it's not a conditional PDF. So maybe let's keep this part over here. But then we will be working with uh, the PDF of the parameters. So sometimes the parameters that we want to estimate is not some deterministic value, but a random variable. And another PDF that we will be encountering is this posterior. Uh, and it will be basically uh, be the conditional PDF of the parameters the parameters that we want to estimate while well, giving the data and the half that has been no, have been observed. Uh, well, this is a notation that we will be working with very soon. So really, uh, just a fact that uh, in the three in the three next up sections, uh, we will also be covering a little bit what is the connection between this type of estimations uh, and the regression that we have, sorry, and the regression types that we have seen in the previous chapter, something like lasso and rich, or, or what he describes as vanilla regression, right? the, the most simple case. Okay. So first we start with maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, maximum likelihood is going to be a, uh, Differentiated as ML. And as a number suggests, we're going to maximize some likelihood function. So let's start by defining such function. We have some observed, observed data. So we can consider some set of n data points, see uh, these specific values. And then we're going to try to use a distribution that models these observations. That is, for each of these observations, we have some random variable. <clears throat> so from this set of observed data, we have this uh, multidimensional vector that is really a random variable, but in the non-unidimensional case. And now we ask ourselves, what is the joint density for such random variable? Because that allows us the most general description for this data that has been observed. Uh, however, we're going to be parameterizing this joint PDF. And it's going to be parameterized, parameterized via certain parameter. And again, I, I make the distinction that even when we say one parameter, we really mean a, a vector. It could be one or more values. And so now the PDF that we're using to model our data, <coughs> It changes because it depends also on the possible parameter. So it's it is a function of the observed data and the parameter that we are considering. As we can see over here, right? It's a PDF of the random vector with a specific parameter uh, data. Uh, X is observation. That is what we find from the measured data. Uh, it's already fixed, so it will be a little bit easier to work with in the mathematical calculations. Uh, and the second argument, this data value is just a parameter that we want to estimate. We want to, our goal is to find the optimal data that offers the best explanation to the observed data X. Uh, and that will be in the sense that we will be maximizing this specific PDF. The PDF that depends on the observed data and the assumed uh, parameter values, or value or values. So, well, this is uh, the part where he defines a, a different likelihood function that he then redefines into in another context. But over here, is simply what we have already been working with, this PDF that depends on the data and the, and the parameter. So uh, we have some random vector of n, of n random variables. Uh, of course, uh, this random vector x has some join PDF. Uh, it has some, it has a dependence on this parameter theta that we are assuming. And so we simply define this likelihood function as a density depending on such values. Okay, over here, why I, I didn't want to mention the, the part, this part, because it, it's another type of likelihood function. So in this case, uh, this definition, uh, 
we have we have to be cautious in the fact that this function, well, it does depend on theta and x, but it is not a conditional PDF because theta, this parameter, is not a random variable. We are fixing some possible theta and then working with the PDF. So uh, until no, up to now, it's the parameter is completely deterministic. I mean, it's a, but it is the same functional form as a like as the conditional PDF of uh, x given theta, right? Uh, yes, it if is. Theta was a random variable, I guess. <laughs> it seems confusing. Uh, I mean, I always think of the likelihood as a likelihood as a likelihood, but I guess he's making a distinction in that theta is just a parameter here. So now that's what turns the conditional PDF into a likelihood, which is not a PDF at all, right? Right. Okay. Uh, it really is the same, but I, I wanted just to make a distinction because he says this likelihood function is not a conditional PDF, but in the later section it says that yeah. the likelihood function is a conditional PDF. So I, yeah. I got a little bit confused over there. Yeah, that is confusing. But then, uh, like, le they are simply separate topics, but uh, in, the end, in the end of the day, they really are the same type of function. Only the assumption about theta is changing. Okay. The interpretational issue, I got it, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, the usual uh, problem arises when we're working with high dimensional data. So something like a ton of, of observations uh, because this joint distribution becomes too complex. So we simply assume independence of observations. Um, and we know really that the, for, sorry, the formula for the density simply changes as a product. And also to simplify things, we're going to assume that these data, uh, they are coming from ident independently and identically distri distributed uh, random variables. So if we take a look at the, how, how would be the covariance matrix for this specific uh, type of random variable. Uh, it's pretty simple. It's just a diagonal with identical values, sorry, a diagonal matrix with identical values in the main diagonal. So now the UN density, the UN density simplifies to this product where each of these is uh, unidimensional with respect to the observed data, but also parameterized via this parameter data. So again, uh, simply the likelihood function that we want to maximize, it changes in the same fashion because it's really the same as this expression. But now, uh, because log is an increasing function, if you want to maximize this, you can also maximize the logarithm of that. Uh, and because it is positive, so it's well defined. So this expression turns into this, and this is the log likelihood function that it's easier to work with and we're going to be maximizing. So a small example, uh, consider a case of IID Gaussian random variables, X1 up to Xn, and with a mean mu and variance delta square, no, sigma? Well, what was the name for this one? For the variance symbol, do you remember? For the which symbol? Uh, for the variance? Yeah, sigma, you got it. Right. Ah, yeah, sigma. Okay, for sigma. variance sigma squared. Um, again, this is simply a formula. When then for the unidimensional case, but parameterize via the parameters. And as you uh, will expand this, the log likelihood function becomes this part. So, a similar example for the log likelihood of a sequence of IID but only random variables with parameter theta. And that is a probability of success. So this is a joint density, just a product of these values. And now the log likelihood uh, becomes this expression over here. And we can also visualize this likelihood function. Uh, well, because it's not uh, unidimensional, 
It's actually three-dimensional three in the graphics over here. But the main takeaway take away, uh, would be to understand a little bit better uh, how does this likelihood function uh, depends on the observed data that is in these measurements X um, and on the parameters data. So we come back to the previous example of the IID Bernoulli random variables. We already know what is the log likelihood. Um, and they are going to, to graph such a specific function simply relabeling this sample sum as x. Um, and it's over here. This is the graph. And we can see once you fix some specific value for the, well, some specific set of observed data, then the look like function function is changing uh, with respect to the parameter say that one. <coughs> and it can be quite different. In this case, it's a parabola almost, and in the other one is almost a parabola, but kind of shifted to the left. So again, we want to find the peak of this function, which, are, which is the theta value that maximizes this expression. Well, this graph in this case. Uh, and, and such uh, estimate will be called the maximum likelihood estimate. Really, that is the, the parameter theta that maximizes the, uh, the likelihood function that we have defined. We have already worked with, the, with how the log likelihood looks for the case of IID, but not random variables. So maybe let's find the maximum likelihood estimate for, for that case. So we want to maximize this. Um, and really is the, the usual case that we do in differential calculus, simply differentiate, evaluate to zero, and you obtain this value. I, I am not sure why this, this critical point would be a maximum uh, and not a minimum. Uh, I think it's not explained, so maybe it's completely trivial, but I, I know I haven't given it much so. So as we observe here, uh, for this case of IID Bernoulli random variables, uh, the maximum likelihood estimate, it's really the sample mean. Uh, this pattern is going to arise quite frequently that the maximum likelihood estimate is going to have, well, will be the sample mean once we're estimating the, well, the mean parameter of the, observed data, well, of the joint density, no, of the common mean for all of the random variables that describe each of the observed data. So, at least looking at the graph over here, uh, one, one may wonder, why does the shape of the likelihood function change so much once the data presented is different. Uh, as we can see over here that this kind of parabola shifted once we dealt with another scenario for observed data. Um, it, that, that happens because this likelihood function has to reflect even the extreme cases. So even in this scenario of IID Bernoulli random variables, it even has to represent the possible cases the, sorry, the possible case where all of the trials were successful. So something like all of these dots were labeled as green. So really a sample sum would be, well, the number of observations as well. So due to this part, with respect to extreme cases, uh, there is a quite a bit of dependence between the likelihood function and the observed data. Uh, now, we can also uh, understand this concept of estimation of maximum likelihood. Uh, directly, we are working with the PDF of the likelihood function. That is it, that f of x expression that we had already defined. Uh, and that would be this over here. 
over here. Well, I, I don't remember the argument that he presents. I mean, why would be different? Because he's just simply working with the case of IID Gaussian variable. But in that case as well, when we, when you want to, to estimate the mean of the Gaussian distribution that represents, sorry, that it's associated with the data observed, then in that scenario, you also get that this maximum likelihood estimate is also a sample mean. And this will be a, a recurring pattern when trying to estimate the, the mean of the random variable that describes the data. Uh, ah, yes, uh, and the explanation, well, it kind of makes sense. Uh, in this case, again, we are, we are working with the case of IID Gaussian variables. So maybe consider the, the case with that. There is only one observation. So it comes from a Gaussian distribution. So what will be the uh, our estimate? Sorry, our maximum likelihood estimate. It's just uh, what maximizes this function. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's pretty clear. It's just the only possible value that it, that it has. And that is the only value observed, x1. So in the case of only one observation, this maximum likelihood estimate is precisely the, the data observed, that single observation that we have encountered. Um, there is a comment over here of perhaps this guess, well, it's not a guess, this calculation that uh, the mean is precisely this, but no, <laughs> that this estimate is precisely the observed value. Uh, it could be bad or it could be wrong, but really it's the best we can do if we only have one observation. If you have two observations, well, you can work with the data X1 that has been observed or with the data X2 that has been observed. Uh, and a common scenario with this case could occur that the maximum, like the maximum likelihood estimate is precisely if such observed data. But we, we can't like, determine if X1 or X2 has a bigger influence or importance. So really what we get is that the maximum likelihood estimate for this case of two observations uh, is just the average. So like they have the observed data, each, each one of them has like equal extreme uh, for our maximum likelihood estimate. Uh, well, uh, what he says, or that's what he mentions over here. Uh, well, and the pattern uh, generalizes for n observations. It's still the estimation for the mean of the Gaussian distribution is simply a sample mean. So, uh, what is it? And okay. So, uh, a summary of what we have just covered about maximum likelihood estimate. Uh, really, is you have your PDF or well, your likelihood function uh, that measures how likely it is that we will get some observed data if the underlying parameter for the distribution of the data is theta. Um, we simply want to maximize this, this function. Well, there were some applications. I, I didn't really read them. Although maybe the physics one, the physics one, this one over here, it's interesting because it, it comes back a little bit in the, I think in the last subsection uh, and in one of the exercises. Uh, well, over here is simply a, a practical example uh, that is to find the maximum likelihood estimate for uh, some assumption of the of the data. In this case, the one that we have already we're working with, a set of IID Gaussian random variables. And if you if you maximize this uh, likelihood function with respect to the parameter uh, mu, the, the mean, then you want to maximize this function and you get uh, this part. 
the parameters, well, there are two values now, the mean and the variance. So really, I think he meant over here the, the how do you say? The partial derivative. Partial, yeah. 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 Uh, and at this, uh, what we get is what has been arising so far, that the maximum likelihood estimate for the mean is again the sample mean. Uh, but this part, I'm not sure if this it is that one or... I know it comes back later on. Uh, yeah, it comes back when we work with um, biased uh, or unbiased estimators. So really just the... A ML estimate for the variance is this expression over here. So I think that is a formula for the population a variance. Yeah. Well, there is a net. Okay. He, he talks later about that, that that's a biased estimator. Yes. Uh, well, there, were, there was an example of what was some, but maybe let's skip it. Uh, again, in the case of the high dimensional Gaussian, we still have the same uh, pattern. Uh, maximum likelihood estimate of the mean is a sample mean. Uh, maximum likelihood estimate, in this case, it would be of the covariance matrix, matrix, sorry, is this expression. Now, uh, over here is a part, uh, when is the previous chapter? related to this one. Um, well, they are closely related in a way, a maximum likelihood estimation, but you have to, to perform, uh, sorry, to make an important assumption about the distribution of the error terms. Uh, really that assumption is that this error follow a, distri a Gaussian distribution with these parameters being uh, delta squared, no, sorry, sigma squared, the variance, uh, where is it? I know, it, it has some variance. Uh, over here is a, the, the similar formulation that we had been working with in the case of regression. This is the, the kind of output that you want to predict, some transformation of the observed data. There is a function, sorry, the, the set of functions phi sub zero up to, up to phi sub d minus one. And again, our parameters and our errors, but this can be expressed in this form for the uh, sum of the squares of the errors. Really the, the connection comes in this part. Uh, or here, in the case of regression, we were optimizing this expression and the solution uh, turned out to be this one. We made no assumptions for the model. However, in the case of maximum likelihood, again, we're maximizing the likelihood function. Well, this would be the expression, but the solution happens to be the same. If we make the assumption that the errors or that this, this term follow this type of distribution, a uh, Gaussian one. So if you know that the noise is Gaussian, then the regression solution is going to be the same one as the ML1. Uh, however, in practice, we don't know if the noise is Gaussian or, or not. Also an important fact is that if this assumption about the errors is not met, then the regression solution will not maximize the likelihood because it will be different than the, the parameter that maximizes this function over here. No. By, by the way, this is where this concept of using like a student T distribution camp comes in. Another way to do a, re, uh, an, uh, a robust regression is to a maximum likelihood where the error term is assumed to be a student T distribution with, you know, so it has longer tails. That's where that came in. That's the, just, just a little observation. And so what happens in that case of the distribution for errors? Uh, I don't know how the, the actual maximum likelihood 
works out. I don't know if the IT has to be done numerically or whatever, but you can set that in your software. Say, hey, use a student T distribution and it will give you a um, more robust uh, regression, right? Because the T, because the student T distribution has long tails. So that means it's a long, the, it has the same effect as, a similar effect as using the absolute value of the L1 norm, right? In the, in the sense that the longer tails have less, are less surprising, right? The, the longer, the outliers are less surprising, so it doesn't weigh them as heavily. Uh, okay, maybe yeah. I know. If that makes any sense at all. Yeah, it did. Anyway, it's just an observation. Okay, thank you. So about this type of estimates, uh, well, not all estimates are uh, of the type of maximum likelihood. So we want to know, for example, will the maximum likelihood estimates guarantee the recovery of the true parameter? If so, when will that occur? Well, with that case, uh, we will need to define now, yes, a random variable, uh, because so far this expression was only a, a function that depended on, on theta. But now, uh, uh, what, what is it? Oh, no. I was a little bit ahead. So now we will be working with a random variable and such will be the estimators, no, no longer the estimates. So, we have that these observed data are just realizations of random variables x1 up to xn. So if we want the if we want to also take into account the randomness of the variables, then our estimate maybe it should also be a random variable as well. Uh, here's an example: a random variable defined sorry that depends on this n random variables. In this case, it's just the mean of them. Uh, and we will call this theta hat the ML estimator of the true parameter theta. So really the, the difference between this estimate and estimator concepts is that the estimate is a number. It comes from the realization of the random variables it, uh, from the observed data. However, the estimator is a random variable. Uh, it takes as input some set of random variables and the output is another random variable. Now, there are going to be, I think the, he only mentions two, uh, two special properties about this kind of estimators. Uh, and some of them will be present uh, in, in the type of maximum, maximum likelihood estimates uh, that we have already been seeing, that, that we have already seen. For example, in the case of Bernoulli uh, and Gaussian, when we were trying to estimate the mean. So an estimator is going to be labeled as unbiased, is the expectancy of such estimator. Uh, is precisely the, the parameter well, that we have that we have in the population, that is the true parameter theta. Uh, an interpretation of that is that unbiasedness means that the average of the random variable matches the true parameter. Uh, in the case of IID Gaussian random variables that we already work with, one wants to know if this specific maximum likelihood estimator happens to be unbiased. Um, well, one could work with that simply via uh, calculating its expected value. Um, from this calculation, we get that, yes, the true parameter, in that case, that would be the mean, theta, is precisely the expectancy of this uh, estimator. So, yes, this kind of, well, it's not a sample mean, but this kind of mean of random variables. And I will, I will just call it mean. This mean is an unbiased estimator of the population mean. Uh, well, here's an example with it where it is biased, but uh, let's just keep it. Um, yes, this is a this is interesting part that I found about this section. And we come back to the previous example about IID Gaussian random variables. 
So we have some unknown mean mu and unknown variance So we want to estimate. So we already saw the calculations for these maximum likelihood estimators. And this is what we got. Now, interesting to show, I mean, we already did that, that this uh, estimator uh, happens to be unbiased. That is, it satisfies this condition. But what about this one? Uh, ah, wait, sorry. When we're working the example, this uh, capital letter X was uh, was in lower case, but now the estimators, no longer the estimates, uh, it's really just changing this to, to the random variable instead of the observed uh, data. Okay, now, now this is a random variable. So, this is an estimator, so is it unbiased? Uh, we can perform such calculation in a specific case, for example, assuming that the parameter mu of these random variables happens to be zero. So now we calculate the expected value of this, of this estimator. And once we do all of that calculation, we get that over here. The expected value of this estimator for the variance is not precisely the population variance. So it, I mean, it's almost it, but not exactly. But, oh, wait, sorry, there is a, a code. Okay, I just hang up. So we get that this estimator for the variance over here, it is biased. A biased estimator of the population variance. Uh, well, and he mentions that if we changed the expression that we had in the beginning, we changed this uh, number n, we simply re reduce it by one. Then as we can see in, the, in this expression, then yes, now this new estimator, that it is an unbiased estimator of the variance. And that's probably why when we work with the sample variance, we use n minus one instead of n. Yeah, I agree. This section was kind of cool because I've always seen that, but I never knew like where it came from. So it's nice to have some some understanding of that now. <laughs> yes, uh, but there is also a drawback in that flag, and it comes uh, with this. And there is a this new estimator. Okay, so it is unbiased, but it does not maximize the likelihood. So you get unbiasedness but you lose the maximization of the likelihood function. So, well, it's just a summary. An estimator is unbiased if its expected value is the same as the population <coughs> parameter <coughs> that is trying to estimate. Uh, no, yes, sir. And now another interesting property for the estimators is if they are consistent or not. Uh, and now we're going to take into account the fact that these estimators depend on a number of observations. So, well, that number can be pretty small or pretty big. So we're going to wonder, sorry, to work with the, no, to analyze what happens as the number of observations grows. That is, uh, as we take the limit uh, when we, when n tends to infinity. Well, this, here will, this will be the notation for the estimators that depend on n random variables. And the definition uh, is that an estimator is no, <laughs> it's going to be consistent if there is a convergence in probability to, the, to a population parameter. That is, if this limit holds for the probabilities. And the graphic interpretation of this would be that as n grows, uh, that is, as we consider more and more observations, uh, the estimator will be close enough to the true population parameter uh, so that the probability of getting a large deviation will diminish. So in this graphic, as we consider more and more observations, this uh, will deviation from the true parameter, that is this peak, uh, is shrinking 
almost becoming like a delta type distribution. Uh, and so if the probability of the error goes to zero, that is this part over here, then we say that the estimator is consistent. Uh, well, there are two, in general, only in general, two ways to check if an estimator is consistent. One would be simply yeah, following the definition of convergence in probability. But another one uh, is using an inequality that we saw two chapters ago, the Chebyshev's inequality. And that is because this probability that we want to see if it is converging to zero as n grows larger and larger, uh, well, it's bounded. Well, uh, upper bounded? I don't know if that's a term, but Okay. Yeah, that's that's not correct. Okay, upper bounded by this expectancy over here. So you can also check if the limit of this expected value is going to zero. Mm. And again, uh, there is no a uh, uh, com uh, direct correlation between these two concepts of consistency or unbiased, sorry, or bias of an estimator. One does not imply the other. Um, an example of that would be the one. Ah, I'm getting called again. Okay. So a consistent estimator. Uh, the interpretation was that if an estimator is consistent, then if you have enough samples, then the estimator will converge to the true population parameter. Um, an example of when does and bias net does not imply consistency. When you can consider the case again of a Gaussian random variable, but simply with one observation, then the expected, the expected value is now the mean of such Gaussian distribution, but these probabilities, uh, they are not converging to, to zero. So the estimator is inconsistent. And a case where the consistency does not imply unbiasedness. Uh, it's really what we saw for, for the variance case. They are going to show it over, over here. Now, I really didn't get this part completely, this argument. But in this part, they are showing that this, no, wait, where is it? Okay, over here. This variance, uh, maximum, maximum likelihood estimator that we got, in the case of the IID Gaussian random variables, we already saw that it is biased, but we can prove that it is uh, consistent. So if we re-express this summation, that in comes, we get this value. And so if we now take the limiting probability, we get that probability wise, this expression is tending to the variance squared due to the large, weak law of large numbers. Uh, but this part, why does this tend to mu squared probability wise? I, I, I was not completely sure why, but he mentions that similar, similarly for this uh, uh, estimate estimator, sorry, this one over here, then uh, we will get a, a convergence in probability for this to this. No, sorry, to, to this. Well, although the expected value of this does converge to, to mu. I, again, also by the weak law of large numbers. Okay, so maybe that's why. Yeah, it just converges in probability. It's not a strong convergence, almost surely. Maybe it does, but he didn't need that, so. Okay. So it turns out that under certain regularity conditions, uh, the ML estimators of IID observations are always consistent. However, in this, well, it's not a proof, 
he says that it's not complete. But in this part, uh, he doesn't mention what are the precise conditions of regularity we are assuming. So I don't know, let, let's just believe him. There are ways to, uh, to make sure that this consistency occurs for the, maximum, for the yeah. maximum likelihood estimators. I like the idea, we'll just believe them. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I, I, there are only nine minutes left and I, we have only seen the first part. Do, do you want me to go super fast? Uh, I guess our choice is either, you can go super fast. I mean, there's no reason for us to um, go. Well, we could, or we could, it's up to you, or we could continue it next week. And mm, I'd rather keep the, the, the schedule that we have. Yeah, yeah go super fast then. <laughs> okay, okay, so this invariant principle really doesn't come up any anymore, so I will just skip it. Uh, then we are going to perform another type of estimation. Uh, in the, the main difference will be that in the previous case, this uh, value for theta, that that's, was a deterministic value, but now we're going to make that this theta is also a random variable. So now this likelihood function changes to this. I'm getting right. caught again. Okay, so this is a change. Now theta is a random variable. So now this expression, it is, a conditional PDF of X uh, given theta. Uh, and he said that those are the same, but those are the, the values provided by such expressions are the same, but uh, now that theta is a random variable, uh, we have a, a little bit more tools. Uh, now it's important to define some distribution. This is a prior distribution. Uh, well, the person performing the, sorry, the, perf the person intercepting the calculations he or she has complete control over the distribution. And, and that is uh, how does he or she suspect that this parameter uh, is distributed. And we also have to define this posterior distribution. And that is the PDF of the parameters giving the measured data. And we can again use Bayes theorem to get this posterior distribution. Uh, from the PDF that we already were working with, right, with this likelihood function. Uh, well, I already mentioned this, but really this is the main difference now. Now the parameters are a random variable. Uh, we are no longer going to, to maximize the likelihood function, but now we want to maximize this posterior function, this PDF of the parameter. Uh, conditional to the data observed. So the prior distribution was our belief of what would be, sorry, of how this parameter should be distributed. So we can make a lot of assumptions, even the delta distribution. I, I thought that the delta distribution would be, uh, if, sorry, that if you assume a delta distribution for the parameter, the uh, calculations would end up the same as the ML case. But in terms of that, no, it has to be a uniform, right? Different, uniform distribution. If you have and a delta they do much up. Yeah. If you have a delta function prior, then you already are absolutely certain about what the parameters are, and it makes no sense to even proceed any further. <laughs> That's a degenerate yeah. case. It never should happen, probably. Yes, it, is. it will never happen. Yeah. In practice. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm trying to see what to skip, what to not skip. Yeah, you can, uh, you do good. Um, again, we, we are looking to maximize another function. That is this posterior distribution, this specific PDF. Uh, this is the difference, right? A ML case, maximize this likelihood. Map case, maximize this posterior distribution. Um, and the main advantage of using this type of maximization instead of the ML one is that, well, the prior will be useful to us, especially when the number of samples is small, because sometimes we already have some uh, feasible assumptions of how this parameter should behave. Uh, and that is going to take effect into the estimates that we are going to obtain. 
So now we are maximizing this pressure and posterior distribution. This would be the difference. It's really just this factor over here right. that we control the prior distribution. And I will this is what you mentioned as well. Um, let's see, skip, skip, skip. Yeah, you can skip that too. I, just, I mean, you understand this probably already from the base rule stuff, right? Uh, are you in the base rule? Well, I did it before, but yeah. Um, okay, over here. So, we're trying to maximize right, this posterior distribution, but how does it look? Well, at least in this case, uh, again, with IID Gaussian uh, observations, no, sorry, IID Gaussian random variables, then this posterior distribution that we want to maximize also happens to be a Gaussian random variable. And its parameters are, are defined precisely by these estimates that we are getting after maximizing this function. Uh, well, it, there was an interesting part over here of when does the map become the ML, uh, but maybe I just skip it. Uh, this yeah. part was interesting about the conjugate prior because we have control over the prior distribution, but sometimes there are specific, specific distributions that we can assume for the parameters that make the calculations much easier. Uh, he considers an example of a, a Gaussian prior for the case of IID, what is it? Uh, IID Bernoulli random variables. So this, right, the likelihood so, function, yeah. we want to maximize the posterior. But if we assume a Gaussian prior, uh, we get a cubic polynomial, it's hard to solve. Well, it is. Uh, if we assume a Laplace prior, then we need a convex solver. So, for this. However, if we use a prior that follows a beta distribution, so this, then we actually can obtain just like just by hand what is the, the estimate. Um, okay. It turns out, okay, so we're here. So what is a conjugate prior? Well, it is a prior, that is some distribution such that when multiplied by the likelihood to form the posterior, that is, and in this part, we multiply by this likelihood to form the posterior. Then and the posterior takes the same form as the prior. So like the distribution gets preserved. Uh, it happens that every likelihood has its conjugate prior. So, so some specific distribution to make the calculations more, more easy to work with. Um, but it doesn't mean that the conjugate priors are a good one, at least in practice. So really that, that one has to, to, to check if the prior that he's using uh, really is a precise one. However, in some cases, like we saw for the beta distribution as a prior, you have access to some extra parameters. They are called hyperparameters, uh, and they allow you to model your prior so that it fits uh, with the specific problem that you're tackling with. Uh, well, he mentions a bit that part, but uh, we don't have time. Uh, again, there is a, a map within map and regression. Map is linked to regularized regression uh, via this factor, this regularization factor. Again, we have to be to make an assumption about the error for falling Sorry, following a Gaussian distribution, but the part is over here. Uh, if you assume this specific prior, then uh, the optimum value that you will get is the same as the one for rich regression. However, if you assume this specific prior, uh, the optimum value that you, no, sorry, this one. Yeah. And uh, the optimum value will be the same as the case for lasso regression. So then one ponders, uh, with this part over here. Yes, uh, so if there is an analogy between ML and vanilla regression and MAP and regularized regression, uh, how do we choose between one or the other? And it comes back to, 
to to this part. You can you you can do simple regression if you really know nothing about the statistics. So you just want the model. Uh, you can use map if you know some of the statistics of the data. So you can you can define a, a prior distribution. And ML, if you want a simple form solution and you want to have nice properties like consistency and, and biasness. Uh, and this last part, uh, well, it's now another type of estimation. Now we want to work like with a kind of average. Uh, it will be this one over here. In the case of ML, we look for the peak of the of the likelihood. In the case of map, we look for the peak of the posterior. But now in this case of minimum mean square estimation, that is MMSC. Now we want to work with the average or the expected value of the posterior distribution. So again, uh, he mentions that. It, it's not like any of them or any of these methods is better than the other. It depends in the, in the example. In, well, in the practical case, uh, there are some conditions where, for example, MSME and MAP produce the same value, for example, for single peak symmetric distributions. Uh, and again, this last case is also a type of Bayesian estimation. So we have, we begin already with some prior data about the model, so some prior distribution as well. Uh, let's see. Well, this expected value that we want that we wanted to get after doing a lot of things turns out to be only this. That is this estimate happens to be the conditional expectation of of the parameter with respect to the observed data. Uh, well, of this random variable, right? The, the dependence of the parameters with respect with the observed data. So really many calculations, but, but the fact is that this estimate, sorry, this estimate that we want is a this precise expected value. And there was a part where we probably would have needed functional analysis because we were we were trying to minimize with respect to functions but but and the mathematics work, works out fine and we can deal with only probability and still get the results that we want so over well there is a, over here uh, almost to finish up uh, in this case we have i think it was high dimensional Gaussian. I know some specific uh, likelihood function, some assumptions about the prior distribution. And in this case, we perform the estimates, the three one, the three that we have just seen, ML, MAP, and MMSE. And for such case, we obtain different values, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, in the case of the multidimensional Gaussian, that, well, that he mentioned that it comes up quite in practice, then yes, the MS, MMSE estimator turns out to be the same one as the, the one produced by the map. Do they equal? Yes. Okay, so this is the last part. I also find it interesting that in, in, the, in the work of neural networks, and there is some kind of function that, so you want to find a function that minimizes some kind of loss. So similarly, we saw for MMSC, you want to find a function that minimizes some expected value. In this case, it's minimizing this one over here. Um, we, we know that the MMSE is a conditional expectation of the posterior distribution that is this expression uh, turns out to be some conditional expectation. Uh, however, uh, over here, and uh, well, I will just read uh, the equivalence between the MSE estimator and the posterior mean tell us that the hard part related is related to the posterior distribution. Uh, in the high-dimensional landscape, it is close to impossible to determine the posterior 
and it's mean and due to and too many variables too many dimensions and so if we add these difficulties the non-convexity of this function that we want to find as a minimum the training and network is very challenging and also it, there is a misconception that if a neural network produces a model that has very low training error and very low testing error and that doesn't mean that that network is good in general really is good with respect to that type of norm that you have defined for the error. In the case of the L2 norm, uh, really what working with the case similar to this one, as we saw for MMSE. However, uh, such norm is not necessarily the best one for every practical scenario. And I think he mentions over here that if you use such norm for something like smoothing out pictures, then they get too smoothed out. So a norm like L1, it turns out to be better. So L1 does not, does not longer has this term. So uh, the connection between MMSE is lost. MMSD is, is working with that LQ norm. Um, and just a summary to, to finish up. Is minimizing the MSE the best option? So no, because as we saw this case for MMSC, what we are doing is finding the mean of the posterior, that is its conditional expectancy, but there is no reason why the mean is the best. You can also work with the mode of the posterior and such cases precisely as we saw for the map, because the mode is a kind of peak in the density function. And you could also work with the mediums. So really there is no best tool in medium mode or medium. Uh, and the same applies to the case of deep neural networks. Why is this norm the best one overall? Okay, thank you for for not going. <laughs> no worries, man. Good job. Yeah, it's a challenging uh, chapter. And next, so we only have two more chapters left, so we're doing good. We got the uh, chapter on confidence intervals, and I guess then the kind of a uh, the wrap it up after the break, um, the chapter on random processes. So I think this was a good chapter, though it's challenging, but it's good because I definitely learned a lot about um, estimators and all that kind of stuff. I've seen before, but didn't really know. Um, never really looked at the technical parts of it before, so it was awesome. So thank you very much. Okay. Have a good uh, rest of your week. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.